Thank you for joining us for this exclusive Q&A session with Professor Adam Bodison from the charity Mason, the National Association for Special Educational Needs. Now we're very, very proud sponsors of this charity um, here at Axis. We hold them very close to our hearts and we have in fact just signed on with them for another four years. Now, Adam is the chief executive for Nason, and that means he has responsibility for strategic direction and operational delivery across the full breadth of the charity's activity. He is the main point of contact for the board of trustees and has a close working relationship with the Department for Education. He has supported the DfE uh, on operational concerns relating to COVID-19 through his role as the chair of the National SEND Reference Group. So, Adam. Thank you for joining us. How are you today? I'm really well, thank you. And thank, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk about, uh, uh, about the, the response to COVID and, and, and how that works, because there's lots of things happening in school and it's, uh, things are moving at quite a pace. They indeed are. Um, thank you again for finding time to fit us into your busy schedule. Now, we've been speaking to quite a few schools here at Axis, and we have found that some school leaders are quite nervous of taking supply staff um, for obvious reasons. Um, now, we have done everything we can as a company, we think, to safeguard our own staff, um, our contractors, and indeed the wider schools and communities that we work with. We have put interventions in place like simple things like supplying our contractors with these little bottles of hand sanitizer which they can carry around and they can refill um, so they never have to go hunting for them at a school or in a, an alternative setting. Uh, we've also given them things like these little hygiene key rings to help minimize the amount of contact that they have with surfaces and buttons and light switches and things like that. Um, in addition to that we've made access to kind of using PPE and uh, other training available to them. Um, and we've also kind of obviously brought our policies um, in line with what the government is recommending as well. So all in all, um, I hope that what we're doing should put the minds at rest of the schools that we work with. But I'd just be interested to hear what you think about that. Yeah, it sounds like the things you've put in place are absolutely essential and the, and the right things as well. The, the sensible things that are going to help uh, with the practical day to day reality that we're all facing. I think. From my perspective, I just made the point that risk is always there. It was there before uh, the pandemic and will be there long afterwards. It never disappears in that, in that sense. What, what it can happen, though, is that we can manage and reduce that risk, which is exactly what the measures that you've put in place will, will help to do. I think I'd also just make the point when we're thinking about, you know, should we have supply staff or not in our schools? Um, you know, the argument has been played out nationally over the last few weeks of that actually, is it... Uh, riskier to close schools and, and have lots of children missing huge chunks of education or is it uh, or is it riskier to have them in school with some of the risks posed by the, the, the virus and, and and I think overall the approach that's been taken is to say actually the longer term risk of children missing vast chunks of school is the bigger risk here so then it becomes how do we therefore manage that in school process and actually the, the, what you put in place for supply staff coming in school I would, I would imagine is very similar to any other uh, visitor coming into the school. Fab, thank you, Adam. Um, now we did go out to some of the schools that we work with um, and said, you know, we're going to be speaking to you today and ask them if they had any questions that they would like put forward. We did have some responses. Um, so I'll go through those now, if that's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Starting with this one. So what questions should schools be asking agencies before taking any staff from them and that's obviously particularly related to the pandemic situation. Well I mean the reality is that um, schools have got to be comfortable with any member of staff that might be coming into the school whether they be coming for a short term or a long term type of placement so they should ask any questions they need to to, to, to help them to get to that to that level of, of comfort and I would say that's two way as well the, the member of staff coming in wants to feel comfortable with being in the school that they've also got the right measures in place to keep to keep them safe. But as I said before, the key point is that the approach to, uh, to new staff coming in and to risk assessment and that operational day-to-day -day, uh, keeping people safe in schools should mirror what's in place for all staff. Uh, you know, and, I, and I think it's particularly true uh, of longer term supply and uh, you know, making a choice between that kind of um, you know, a, a day or two of supply versus kind of long term supply. Clearly, if you're going for that longer term solution, that minimises uh, some of those risks as well. 
In terms of some of the specific questions, um, uh, you might uh, schools might want to ask agencies what measures and additional training that they've put in place for, for their agency staff that they're going to be coming in. Um, they might also ask the agency what their protocols are in the case of a positive test. So if one of their supply staff that they've provided has a positive test, actually, um, how are they going to tell you about that and what kind of responses uh, will they take internally to that? Um, I think also those uh, supply staff coming into the school um, will want to be uh, mindful of what they're doing outside the school. So the, kind of, uh, the social activities they're involved in, whether that be sports or traveling and so on, often it'll be those wider uh, activities which could have uh, more of an impact on a potential risk in school than actually what's happening in school itself. So again, agencies will want to make sure that they uh, have some sense of, uh, of what's happening uh, in, in general in people's lives to make sure that they can be confident uh, that they're sending people into schools uh, who uh, where the, the risk is minimised as, as much as possible. That makes perfect sense, thank you. I mean should schools consider doing things like asking supply staff to have their temperature taken or fill in specific forms or wear PPE when they're coming in, um, would that be a reasonable thing for a school to ask um, a new member of staff to do? Okay, I'll come back to the PPE in a second, but what I would say is that every school will have their, their own processes and expectations. Um, temperature testing you mentioned there, um, uh, that makes good sense. Not all schools will have the equipment to be able to do that. Um, but, but, you know, if, actually, if they, if they have, actually, that's a, that's a good thing to do. Um, and, and equally, kind of that sense checking, that kind of, uh, you know, what, what people have been, been up to, as I said before, outside of school. It's, it's really interesting area, isn't it? Because you don't want to kind of, uh, cross the line into uh, breaching people's rights to privacy and, and so on but but equally you, there is an obligation to keep children safe and some schools will ask those questions or, or, or ask people to make a declaration that they've not um, done anything which could, could cause a risk in the last couple uh, of weeks in particular. Uh, in terms of PPE um, I think there are some variations there depending on the type of school so um, for very you know, uh, very complex medical needs, uh, for example, so we're talking about aerosol generating procedures, tracheostomies, those kinds of things, there will be some requirements uh, for, for PPE to be worn in certain circumstances. But in general, PPE is not needed uh, in schools. Um, uh, and, and, and in fact, there was an argument to say that um, for some children, particularly in, in, in special schools, uh, where they may have had a you know serious operations in the past if there's someone turns up in full PPE that might have a traumatic uh, impact in terms of reminding them of some of those uh, challenging times when they've been in hospital in the past so there's, there's a there's a flip side to that as well um, um, what, what schools are doing is not, not necessarily having PPE but they're suggesting face coverings so in secondary schools for example when you're moving around the school um, there is a requirement now that face coverings are in place and that's not the same as uh, kind of formal PPE um, and actually lots of schools are covering that off in the kind of almost in the, the, the dress code bit of their policies rather than necessarily the risk assessment bit of their, their, their policies. Um, where PPE is used, just one final point on PPE, uh, it's worth saying that that shouldn't vary um, uh, by, by, uh, by the type of employer. So for example, if you had a health professional coming into the school, um, say so school nurse, and they were doing a, a particular role which a teacher might sometimes do the requirement for PPE or not should be the same for either professional what you don't want is you're saying to the school nurse for example well you have to use PPE and you're saying to the teacher you can't use PPE or something so that would be a, a, a problem uh, I think to, to watch out for. Um, last thing I'd just say is um, uh, when staff arrive at the school I think I would expect there to be some kind of briefing or a short induction or training particularly for new or supply staff, to make sure that they really understand the school's approach to COVID and the mitigations in the risk assessment. So whether that's year group bubbles, um, is it teachers moving around the school or children moving around the school? Is it staggered start and end times? All of those types of things. Um, so they'll need to be familiar with that. And if I was a member of supply staff coming into a school and that wasn't in place, I would probably want to be asking that question to make sure that I was doing the best I could by, by the school and the children. That makes perfect sense. And actually, when you go back to your previous comment about taking people more longer to term rather than day to day, then that would really reduce that kind of induction based workload that the school then have to carry out, wouldn't it? Exactly. So exactly. It would keep everyone, everyone's life a bit easier. Um, I mean, if, if a school does um, 
find out that they've got a case of conf confirmed COVID within their setting, um, and obviously they've had supply staff in recently, would they have a duty to inform the agency about that? Or is that something that would be done sort of through the track and trace system? Well, I think we'd all like to think that the track and trace system uh, d d did all of these things automatically. I think time will tell whether that really works effectively. I think I was hearing over the weekend about 10 million people have downloaded it already, which is good. Um, whether it will work in the way it should, like as I say, we'll see. But the, the key thing here is that communication is absolutely key um, and transparency is key as well. So uh, it, yes, schools should inform uh, the agency if they have a confirmed case. I would say that was a, at the very least a moral responsibility. Um, and similarly, I think agencies will want to advise schools if they've had a member of staff, supply staff in, in that school and they, they subsequently find out that they have contracted the, the virus or had a positive test. Um, uh, what I would say is bubbles obviously are preserved very well inside schools um, and so therefore schools can take the actions they need to take if, if, there, was a, if there was a confirmed case within the bubble. Mm -hmm. But outside schools, uh, it's obviously hard to, to, to control bubbles, you know, people on school buses together and, you know, all of those kinds of things that are happening. And so schools, I think, are in a position where they can't really stop COVID coming in because if that happens that happens but what they can do is limit the spread within the school and between the school and other schools and I think the school and the agency and the individual member of supply staff all have a role to play in making sure um, that, that, that that happens but as you said before you know this is a really good example of where that long-term supply is often a much better option than kind of going for the day-to-day -day supply because it minimizes the risk so in this kind of situation um, we're, we're talking about one person where that one individual has been rather than actually where potentially five individuals have been. Um, so that's clearly obviously uh, much less risky. We're now kind of getting into this phase of local lockdowns where we seem to sort of see the country turning into a bit of a patchwork of, of different rules um, and that does confuse things a little bit for some people I think um, but just for kind of reassurances sake like if a member of supply staff was living in an area um, of local lockdown would they be considered to be a key worker? Would they be able to travel outside that area to still go to work in a school that perhaps wasn't locked down in another area? Yeah, I mean, it's so complex this area because the guidance it seems to be changing at pace almost daily as uh, you know, I've never seen the civil service working so hard to, to kind of write <laughs> guidance and get it out there quickly, you know. Um, and because it's coming out quickly, it does tend to have some inconsistencies in there and particularly inconsistencies between kind of education, health and social care who might even use the language in slightly different ways. You know, for example, when we talk about vulnerable children, that can mean something quite different from a social care perspective and an education perspective and so on. But, but in terms of the specific question, there is a particular piece of guidance. It's the government's COVID-19 contained framework, which actually explains how national and local partners will work together to contain and manage local outbreaks. And in there, it talks about how schools, particularly special schools, will remain open for vulnerable children and for children of key, key workers. And, and it talks there about staff uh, being able to travel in and out of lockdown areas and what circumstances that could happen in. Um, uh, my, my reading of the, of the guidance is that if, if actually um, the attendance of, uh, of staff, and that could be supply staff, uh, professional health staff coming into schools, uh, obviously teachers and, and so on. If those staff are critical to keeping a particular school or setting open, particularly for vulnerable children uh, and children of key workers, then it's very likely the government would view them as being uh, a, a key worker. Um, final thing I'd just say is that the workforce um, will be depleted at different times due to teachers who have childcare issues because of their own children maybe being in an area where there's a local lockdown and maybe they're due to travel to a different area. So I, th I think the reality is that supply staff are, are going to be a really essential resource in those kinds of circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, just coming from the perspective of the members of supply staff, um, you know, if I was working for an agency right now and, and I was being asked to go into four or five schools a week, potentially, um, mm. they could be different schools. Um, I don't think it's happening at that kind of rate at the moment, but it certainly could be. Um, you know, how could I put my own mind at rest um, to make sure that I'm looking after myself in that situation? Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is common sense, isn't it? I mean, I'm not a health professional, but obviously I would say make sure we follow the government's uh, advice and guidance on, on good hygiene. You know, so we've heard about regular hand washing, 
the use of face covering, social distancing and so on. I know in some schools they've even got um, kind of boxes uh, kind of taped out at the, at the front of the classroom for teachers to stay in that teachers to stay in, the, in in that area of the classroom so that they're not getting too close to children and vice versa and so on. So schools will have different things uh, in place and there's obviously government guidance specifically for supply staff who are working across multiple settings. I would see that um, the approach that schools take to that to be very similar to when they have other specialist staff in. So whether that be speech and language therapists, for example, who will also be in and out of lo lots of different schools. And because of that, schools will have systems in place to, to help uh, protect members of staff who are who are not there all the time in particular. Um, just on, and I've said this a couple of times, but I, I do think that common sense also applies to what people are doing outside of schools. Um, there was a, a, a thing reported in the news a few weeks ago where um, there was uh, some teachers, I think, who, who got together for a, 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 a house party um, and every single teacher almost in the school ended up then having to, to, to go uh, into, into self-isolation because there was a positive test. And, and I think the school almost ground to a halt. So that just being careful about what you might be doing in your personal life and how that might impact on the kind of day to day is, is, is always going to be important as well. I mean, mm. overall, my, my advice would be control the things you can control and try not to worry too much about the rest. Absolutely. Um, and then this is just a question really about education, health and care plans. Um, I mean, how has the system been affected by the pandemic? Has there been really big delays in getting them processed or actually, you know, is it a bit easier with people working remotely and able to zoom into meetings and all this kind of thing? Well, it's really quite a mixed picture um, and the impact on EHC plans and processes, I think it's very quite significantly depending on which part of the country you happen to be in. Um, so if, if I think about this in three different ways, so if I think about new requests uh, to get an assessment for an EHC plan, yes, there have definitely been some delays, um, primarily due to staff shortages. I mean, capacity was already a challenge anyway, because the number of requests for an assessment has been growing every single uh, year, and also the number of EHC plans issued has been growing every single year. Um, but resources, of course, have now, in the last few months, been absolutely focused on the day-to-day -day operational reality of things like school transport and making sure PPE is available to the right people at the right time uh, and, and so on. So resources have been, uh, uh, have been redi redirected, if you like, and I think that has led to some delays in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, new plans. Also worth saying, of course, that schools themselves need to be involved in that process and families as well and they've not always been able to actually get 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 in to where they needed to be to be involved in that process because they may have been in isolation or dealing with other things in the schools um, there, there was a few months as well where the government brought in some easements um, in terms of existing ehc plans which essentially were there to prevent local authorities from having legal action taken against them if they failed to deliver the provision detailed in the plan, particularly in the period while schools were closed. Uh, this was quite controversial. Certainly it was seen by some people as a way of denying families and children their legal entitlements, um, which has led to various legal challenges being brought forward. But now that schools are open again in, in earnest, those easements have come to an end. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, you know, in terms of delivery of EHC plans, I think schools are really doing everything they can as our local authorities to kind of get that back to kind of normal day-to-day -day -day practice. The other thing I would say is annual reviews. Again, it's been mixed, um, but this is an area where actually they have become, as, as you said in the question, a bit more efficient and a bit more effective because of those online panels, which were definitely not common practice in the past. Um, that's allowed more of the, the kind of broader set of professionals, notably those from health and social care, to actually be involved and attend those panels. And it's one of those things which I hope will be the, the silver lining, if you like, to come out of, of this. And it's something that carries on going forward uh, long term because it's really, I think, helped with that annual review process. So the last question that I had really just for you was, um, anyone who has further questions or concerns or their staff feel unsure and they're still looking for ways um, to find training and support where can they go to find that well of course we're talking to, to, to yourself from axis and i know from looking at your website you've got lots of blogs and training and links to resources and things on there so anyone who's obviously working with axis will be able to go on there and see, see those things um, in terms of uh, kind of 
trying to keep up to date with all of the kind of constant guidance that's coming out and the kind of frequently asked questions. Nason has some COVID-19 frequently asked questions on, on our website, um, which we'll, you know, we'll post a, a link to. Um, and, and also the Council for Disabled Children has some frequently asked questions on there as well. Um, and so not only can you read those and, and get a sense of what people are asking and the answers, but if you've got questions yourself, that's a, a mechanism for you to ask those questions. In terms of the training and resources that we've got at NASEN, two things I'd flag to you. One, we, um, uh, we have a, a membership which is actually going to be free from January. So if you're not a member already, then why not? Then that's a perfect time to sign up and that will give you access to lots of resources and the membership magazine, which has got lots of things in there which will be useful. But also we've got an annual webinar pass as well now uh, at NASEN. Um, which, uh, which costs 200 pounds a year at the moment and you get 30 plus webinars so i think it works out something like seven pounds a webinar um, so that's really good value as well in terms of getting access to a whole range of training which you of course can do from home as a as a home worker so please do take advantage of, of all of those opportunities absolutely um i think that brings me to the end of the questions that i had for you um is there anything else you would like to add or mention before we finish up adam yeah, just just one thing really, which is I know we're not really doing the clapping thing anymore, but I actually I'd just like to take a moment to applaud everybody who's out there working so hard to keep schools open and, and safe for, for children. Um, it, I just really wanted to say thank you. It really is very much appreciated. I could not echo that more um, fully, having had the experience of homeschooling my six-year-old last term and trying to juggle other duties in my life. So absolutely agree with you on that one. Um, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you this morning. Um, we know how busy your diary is, so without further ado, I will let you go. Um, but again, thank you for your time, Adam. It's very much appreciated. It's a pleasure. Thank you.